Good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is Dyke Hendrickson, and this is the podcast Life Along the Merrimack. Each week at this time, we talk about the health and history of the Merrimack River. Today, we're going to talk about the Coast Guard, uh, which, of course, was the birthplace of the Coast Guard is Newburyport. But I wanted to mention one news item about the Merrimack River, that in a recent week or two, the governor has signed a bill which makes it required for sewage treatment plants upriver to make a public announcement when they have um, put effluent into the river. And this occurs um, largely because rainwater and effluent goes into sewage treatment plants in Haverhill, Lawrence, Lowell, and Manchester. And then sometimes there gets to be so much liquid, so much water that all this is released. It's a combined sewage discharge. And so it's a very difficult thing for people downriver, such as those of us in Newburyport, particularly boaters in Newburyport. They should know when these discharges have been made. I mean, there are millions of gallons of effluent. Now, granted, it's a big river. And um, there's different ways of calibrating it. But I think everybody along the river, certainly in Newburyport, Salisbury, and Amesbury are very pleased this is going to happen. If there's been a two-day rain in, say, Manchester and, and uh, Lowell let go, you know, no one's going to go swimming downriver. You might not want to take your boat out. You might not want to put your dog into the river while you're playing down at Cashman Park. This is a big deal. Now, some of these sewage treatment plant operators kind of opposed it. Because, I mean, they're good people. And if they had the money, they would improve the sewage treatment plants. But this gives them another uh, responsibility. It gives them another chance to get, be criticized as if to say, well, you, only, you, know, you should have reported after two hours and you waited nine hours to report. So it brings more responsibility to them. But so be it. Um, a lot of legislators and the North Shore voted for it. And the um, Merrimack River Watershed Council actually pushed this uh, bill very forcefully. And in fact, they had emails go out um, and said, look, these are the key people on the North Shore down in Beacon Hill. Please email them and say you want it passed. So I actually did email both the House and the Senate. So I feel good about that. But this will happen probably by this boating season. So that's a victory. And um, as we move forward, um, hopefully things will get cleaner. Uh, Manchester, New Hampshire, for instance, recently signed an agreement where they will put $232 million into improving their sewage treatment plant. Now that's a lot of money. It's over 20 years, I get it, but that's a lot of money. So today we're gonna to be talking somewhat about the success of the river and also about the Coast Guard. And I would mention that one reason I'm going over the Coast Guard is because I'm speaking to a national group this weekend, the National Maritime Historical Society. And they're based out of New York, but they have members all over the East Coast and uh, different places as well. So I'm honored to be speaking to them. Um, I'm talking about the great Merrimack River and the Coast Guard and how it was found here. So I'm gonna be having some Coast Guard slides. I'm gonna move right along. And part of it is, you know, my desire to go over my material before I get to this fine national audience. And this is Joppa Radio 96.3. Um, it's Comcast TV, Channel 9 locally. And so again, we're here to talk about the Merrimack River and many occurrences that have taken place on it. The Coast Guard um, was founded in about 1790, or let us rephrase, the birthplace of the Coast Guard is in Newburyport. In about 1790, um, major people such as Alexander Hamilton got together with President uh, Washington and said, in 1789, and said, look, we have no money uh, to run our good uh, new government. And so Washington said, well, what do you suggest? And Hamilton said, well, I suggest a revenue cutter service where we build some ships 
that are small and fast and armed. And we make sure we cut down on smuggling and also that we go on these large vessels coming in on the North Shore, Newburyport and Salem and Boston, and all the way down to New York and Annapolis, and make sure that they're paying the adequate amount of, of duty on these large cargoes because the war had ended. You know, it's a golden age of Newburyport and much of the North Shore between, say, 1790 and 1807. Um, and it's a, it's a golden time because there was no war. Newburyport had many, many tall ships and commerce was really going well. And so Hamilton's idea was a good one. And he actually had been, he grew up in the West Indies. And of course there was much trade, there were um, much commerce in the West Indies. He knew a lot about trade, but he also knew a lot about smuggling. So Washington said, okay, give it a try. They did uh, get going. 1790, uh, they started building the Massachusetts, which was built in Newburyport, and 1791, it was launched. It was the first revenue cutter. And that's why Newburyport is not only considered, but is officially the birthplace of the Coast Guard. Lyndon Johnson, uh, who was president in 1965, actually signed a writ to say that Newburyport is the birthplace of the Coast Guard. It wasn't known as the Coast Guard then. Uh, it was the Revenue Cutter Service and wasn't, didn't become the Coast Guard until 1915. But this was the start. Newburyport was ground zero. And um, it was a big moment at that time. There is a, um, some statues down at the waterfront. Here's one of them that indicate that this is uh, where the Revenue Cutter Service started. And it's not a very large uh, stone etching, but still it's down there. I think I lived in Newburyport for 10 years before I realized it was there. It's right behind the firehouse. And here is, and I'll try to, you know, keep being illustrative in my talk because a lot of people listen, some watch, but some listen. And here we're looking at the Newburyport waterfront. And this is, um, was rebuilt five or six years ago under Mayor Donna Holliday's uh, tenure. And this is a memorial in the foreground. It's for seven young fishermen who died at sea. That's since 2000. Obviously, if you went way back, it would be much larger. But I think they did a good job with the memorial. And behind that is the Harbor Masters headquarters. When we talk about the Coast Guard, one of its greatest rescues took place in 2012. And this was a situation when the tall ship the bounty um, got involved in Hurricane Sandy. And it should have been avoided. You know, it had, in late summer, the bounty uh, had been refitted up in Booth Bay Harbor, Maine, had come down along some of the North Shore communities, actually, and then was in New London, Connecticut, when it started down to Florida. This is late November, I believe. And so a lot, several, you know, of the crewman said, you know, there's a big storm out there, Captain. And um, the captain did not listen. He wanted to get to Florida. He had a commercial engagement there and he was not about to um, put off his trip. Now, the bounty was built in 1960 uh, for the movie which starred Marlon Brando, Mutiny on the Bounty, and had a lot of um, uh, computerized maps and a very good communication system. So even though it was an old vessel or built to be an old vessel, it had very good technology, but perhaps because in on the sea, it's still a bad thing to try to contradict the captain or try to argue with them. They went out to sea and boy, did they get in trouble. So when they got to North Carolina, the vessel started to sink, as you just saw. Captain, Ro captain Robin Walbridge um, was the captain. He was the one who did not heed um, the maps, the communications. Um, even numerous people on his crew said, you know, this was a very large storm. And once he looked at the maps, he finally said, well, I think we can get around it. We'll go east. And so he could have come into a harbor you know, Norfolk, 
or um, some of the different places, Philadelphia. He did not. He kept, he started going east, which is a very bad thing. And the Coast Guard did a great job. They had a crew of 16 and the Coast Guard rescued 14. Here are the two individuals who did not survive. That's Captain Walbridge, who we just saw, and Claudine Christian, um, who was one of the people who was on a crew member, but she wasn't experienced. You know, she lived in California. She was 42. She didn't have a lot of experience uh, on the sea. She, this is, I wouldn't call, she was kind of going for Lark, you know, but the seas got high and she was unable to get into a lifeboat. Um, there were two lifeboats out there and they did get um, uh, 14 of the people uh, who had gone overboard did get into the, uh, the, life, the lifeboats. <clears throat> And the good thing about that is the lifeboats had covers, so the sea wasn't coming in. They didn't have to bail all the time. But her body was never her body was recovered, and she was you know rushed by a chopper to a hospital in uh, on the coast of North Carolina. But she did not survive, and Captain Walbridge's body was never found. Claudine Christian um, curiously was. Uh, longtime relative of Fletcher Christian, the um, mariner who was involved in mutiny on the bounty uh, two centuries earlier. So the Coast Guard played a very big role. And Jane Pena is a co-pilot in the Coast Guard. She was awakened at five in the morning and told to fly into Hurricane Sandy. So I interviewed her several times. Um, first, when she was in North Carolina, then she was shipped to Alaska, and we kept in touch, and then she was in Mobile, Alabama. But she was a great person, returned my phone calls, which actually makes her a great person. And I said, what were you thinking of when they told you that you have an assignment at 5 a.m.? So she said, the first thing we did is go online and see what the vessel looked like. We didn't think anything could possibly be out there, and so... We saw what it was, it was a tall ship, and we got ready. And she did have a telling remark. She said, you know, this is what we do. We train for this, we were ready. And even though, you know, the seas were 30 to 40 feet and their gusts of wind up to you know, 60 knots, they went out in a chopper looking for the wreck. Now, I wanna point out that a fixed wing aircraft, AKA an airplane, Coast Guard airplane, had been out on the water the day before and had seen the vessel. So they had a, a position for to give the Coast Guard. In other words, the choppers weren't just going out there looking. They had a position and uh, Jane was one of those who went out. This is from the actual um, rescue in the Atlantic. Um, a fellow a called a Coast Guard swimmer is going down. So the, the captain, the pilot of the Coast Guard chopper holds it in place. The swimmer goes down, drops off, and is suddenly, then once he gets his bearings, goes over to the first lifeboat. And this was a situation where they took five or six people off the, one of the lifeboats and said, you know, this is all we can do. There'll be another chopper behind us. But this is an actual photo. And this is what it would look like, um, tough duty in the stormy Atlantic. This is an exercise. Uh, this is not an actual event, but you can see it's uh, the facsimile is setting up the people he's rescuing in the lower left. The swimmer comes down and he takes up one person at a time. He's winched back up into the chopper. And it must be one of the great skills of maritime life uh, as a Coast Guard chopper to be able to hold the vehicle over the same spot and have you know, your crew winch it up. And, you know, this is a very dramatic event. When we talk about life saving, um, we go back to about 1788. There were scores of shipwrecks off of every port in New England and Plum Island certainly had many of them. Uh, the Humane Society started about 1788 
This is a photo from about 1892 off of Plum Island in Massachusetts. So you can see, you know, the rescue team going out, the vessel is under duress, and this is off of Plum Island. Another famous rescue was in 1952 when the Mercer was saved and um, there was a movie made out of it several years ago, Their Finest Hours. So it did bring into the fact that the Coast Guard has been very valuable um, and has, you know, will go into just about any kind of weather. And so this is a success story, the Mercer and the Pendleton off of Cape Cod in 1952. This is probably a more normal for um, a Coast Guard vessel. You know, if a boat has lost a keel, uh, not a keel, a pillar, um, if they, their battery conks out, if they can't go forward, uh, they can call the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard goes out to check. The Coast Guard once, you know, towed such vessels into the harbor, but since 9-11 and the greater responsibilities, in security, the Coast Guard will, you know, get their position, call into a third party like Towboat USA and say, look, I see that you're stable, you're doing well, we're going to leave for other assignments now, but the Towboat USA will be out here shortly and here's the, you know, the information for them. So that is a big responsibility of the Coast Guard is to watch out for the many, many vessels on North Shore here on the Atlantic. Well, talking about life saving, this is an iconic figure in the North Shore and along Massachusetts and New England. He, Joshua James, was one of the great life savers. Is one of the great old salts. I mean, you can see all the medals he has gotten, and he lived in the late nineteenth century and saved hundreds of lives. Another. Key figure in saving lives was Ida Lewis of Newport. Now, they didn't permit women in the Coast Guard during her time, but um, she grew up on an island of the Coast Guard. Lighthouse was there. And so she and her family were very accustomed um, to lighthouse living. And also, when disaster struck, she would go out and help rescue the mariners. And here is Ida Lewis in an artistic rendering in the process of saving lives. So this is some of the events that are showing how much um, life saving is important. And I would mention this is 96.3 radio, Joppa radio, and also seen on Comcast Channel 9. Sumner Increase Kimball was not, I don't know if he was much of a mariner, but he was a good bureaucrat. And he was involved in Washington during the creation of the Coast Guard. As we mentioned, the Coast Guard wasn't actually named the Coast Guard until 1915. At that time, the Life Saving Service merged with the Revenue Cutter Service, which we have discussed, to constitute the modern Coast Guard. In 1939, the Lighthouse Service joined these two uh, services and became the modern Coast Guard. The Baker twins were among the first women ever in the Coast Guard. They did clerical work in Washington. And then as we go up the list in terms of chronology, they were, say, 18, 1918 to 1920. Um, we go up a little farther into uh, Prohibition, which lasted from 1920 to 1933. And one of the Coast Guard's greatest challenges in New England was stopping the smuggling of alcohol during Prohibition. On the left here um, is a vessel filled with um, whiskey, and the two vessels on the right are Coast Guard. This was um, taken in Boston. And then when we get to the 40s, we have the spars, the World War II, of course. It was all hands on deck. Women were permitted to join. And they had their own little name for themselves, Semper Paratus, always ready. So close to... 12,000 um, spars joined the Coast Guard during the war years from 41, say, to 46. And just about, they did a great job. I mean, there's a lot of documentation to say how well they did. But just about all of them were mustered out in 1946. 
Women did not really join the Coast Guard in any major way until 1976, when the Coast Guard, Coast Guard Academy in New London, Connecticut, permitted women to join. This is one of the great vessels of the Coast Guard. It's the Eagle. Um, it was built in Germany in the 30s, taken as a war prize by the US, and Coasties train on it today. In fact, it's frequently down in New London, Connecticut, on the dock right next to the Coast Guard Academy. Here's another shot of the Eagle with a chopper um, going up the New England coast, a 300 foot vessel. And choppers didn't actually become used until the 40s. Um, Igor Sikorsky uh, down in Connecticut um, pioneered the choppers and he pioneered a lot of other aircraft as well. But this isn't it, you know, it's an iconic example of uh, the Coast Guard, you know, in full gear and getting ready for anything. One of the great changes for the Coast Guard took place following 9-11. And step one is to talk about how many people the Coast Guard rescued. If you know New York, you know that Battery Park is at the bottom of Manhattan. Thousands of people ran to Battery Park. They did not, it wasn't far. They didn't know what was happening. The Coast Guard played a tremendous role in rescuing people. They came down from Connecticut. They came across from New Jersey. They came from up the Hudson. Um, scores of boats. Uh, and the Coast Guard was extremely useful at that time. After this attack, um, the Coast Guard, um, which was in the Transportation Department, moved into Homeland Security. In my book, The uh, New England Coast Guard Stories, I, I did a lot with individuals. I'm a journalist. I was with the Daily News here in town. I was with the Boston Herald, Portland Press Herald up in Maine. And I interviewed a lot of Coasties. Here's Patrick Brown. He was a commanding officer in Newburyport. And as I understand it, and I went from Northern Maine to Southern Connecticut, Newburyport is one of the most desired places to be stationed. Paul Rooney of Newburyport is in the Coast Guard Reserve. He also was a part owner of Bob Lobster on the way to Plum Island. And so he um, serves in another part of the Coast Guard. There are about 42,000 Coasties in active service. There's about 8,000 reserve officers like he is. There's about 6,000 civilian employees and there are close to 30,000 um, auxiliary members. That means they help out um, if the coasties are full or they need to give tours. Um, there are many, many auxiliary members all over the country. John Christensen was a captain of the Seneca, birthed in uh, the North Shore, the, not the North Shore, the North End of Boston. He had been in the Navy for three years and he joined the Coast Guard doing very well. I said, why, you know, why didn't you, why the Coast Guard? And he said, well, in the Navy, there's not much to do unless there's a war going on. But with the Coast Guard, you get a chance to help people almost every day. And I remembered that because so many of the coaches that I met are really good people. They want to do a good job and they want to help and they want to make the country more secure. Megan Cahoon was uh, one of uh, 33 Coasties in Rockland, Maine. She was the only woman at the time. But the Coasties up there and in most places don't live in a building. So she had her own apartment. You know, she said there was, she didn't really get hassled by the guys. She likes to teach. And she said, you know, everyone's there to learn and to do good. I did not have a problem. Not that problems don't occur elsewhere. But the Coast Guard has the fewest complaints from women of any of the services uh, of the U.S. Here's um, the Abbey Burgess, a buoy tender, which are very important. And also um, there's those vessels that um, break ice in the winter. Now this is winter isn't that cold, but in many winters in Maine, in Maine particularly, ice bakers are helpful so they can get heating oil up the river. Here's a Coast Guard exercise. This is similar to what we saw, but they practice quite a bit. And this is dropping a swimmer in and then picking that swimmer up. Lieutenant Commander Karen Kukwitz helped me. Um, she got an interview with 
for me with the admiral at the time. I was having trouble because, you know, I'd be talking to a coastie, I'd set up the interview, and then they're not used to dealing with the media or authors. So they say, why, why are you asking me so many questions? Or does my commanding officer know you're here? So she helped me get an interview with the Admiral and things got better after that. Commander Valerie Boyd <clears throat> has had a great career. I interviewed her and at the end of the interview, because I'm a journalist, I said, is there anything I didn't get to? And she said, well, in the last you know, 10 years, my husband and I have had three children and I'm going to pick up my three little girls at 5.30. So isn't this amazing? She's had a good career and she's also has uh, three youngsters. Her husband is in the Coast Guard, and that makes life easier. Here is Rear Admiral Stephen Poole, and on the right, he's the person I interviewed. After I interviewed him and told people I had interviewed him, um, things got better. And Rear Admiral uh, Sangas is on the left, and he took over, was in, here in Boston for two years, and he's moved on as well. One of the uh, officers who retired called me up and said, gee, could you come up and sign the book? And I said, I'd be happy to. Uh, you know, what's the reason? And he said, well, I was a commander of this boat uh, on, in, you know, in heavy seas, and um, we didn't lose anybody. No one was injured, and I'm just, you know, proud of it. And so this is an example of, you know, on a, my book called Nautical Newburyport, there was a, a picture of the Coast Guard and deep seas. Here's the Escanaba 270 foot cutter. This is a vessel that goes into the Caribbean. Uh, they look for drugs. They also help out with vessels coming uh, loaded with people who want to immigrate. And, you know, they stop these leaking and dangerous vessels. They frequently take the people back to where they came from. And so this is, you know, they feel they're saving lives because as you may remember over the last decade or two, many vessels are not in good shape and they capsize and lives are lost. The Coast Guard Academy, New London, Connecticut, as I mentioned, has started taking women in 1976. Now I understand um, the last class that came into the Coast Guard Academy it was 40% women. So things are changing. This is our last slide. And again, this is a Joppa Radio 96.3 and Comcast TV on local channel nine. This is uh, station Merrimack River in Newburyport. Um, it has about 26 coasties assigned to it. It's a desirable uh, stationing to be in Newburyport, but they have a lot of you know, hard work. There are numerous people who get marooned either off of Plum Island, or they'll be coming in the Merrimack River, and there's a significant sandbar. Right now, it's at the south piece of the river, but the river's narrow, it is shallow, and many mariners who haven't been here before get hung up on um, that sandbar. And so the Coast Guard goes out, does what they have to do, or also the Merrimack is a very difficult river to traverse because you have a, a very strong current going into the ocean. You have a significant tide. It might be going out. It might be coming in. It's a very difficult river. And as I say, it's shallow and there's a difficult sandbar. So these are things that people all have to be careful about. So those are some of my thoughts on the Coast Guard um, on Joppa Radio 96.3. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next week. We talk about the life of the river, the history and health of the Merrimack River. And again, thank you for being here. I'm gonna be speaking to a national group this week, which I'm excited about. And um, just talking about the Coast Guard, the Merrimack River, and uh, indicating it's a very good service and Newburyport and this part of the North Shore is quite a you know, delightful spot in which to live. Thank you very much. This is Dyke Hendrickson. We'll see you next week.